Good evening, uh, blog viewers. Uh, we will continue on our p series on love today. Um, we will continue, uh, in fact, uh, looking uh, more at Plato's ideas on love. Uh, of course, Plato, um, the uh, very word platonic in, in, in even common, common discourse today is understood uh, with respect to love as sort of a platonic conception of love. I think it's typically viewed as a love that does not have sort of sexual uh, dimensions to it, but is sort of uh, a friendship or a very strong companionship between like-minded people. Um, and it's, it's sort of separated from more passionate, uh, uh, sort of earthly sort of love. Um, and so um, the Phaedrus is actually a dialogue, a platonic dialogue, that, uh, that, um, that gives a lot of uh, meaning to that uh, conception of platonic love. And we'll see exactly sort of what, Pla what, what Plato's um, uh, ideas on love is, are and, and how, um, how uh, the platonic view of love has gotten popular and, and to what extent it actually does justice to Plato's ideas. Um, so we'll see all of that in, in the Phaedrus today. Uh, but I want to start out by um, remarking a little bit on, on, again, the virtue of love. And I think it's, it's undeniable that everyone in the world, uh, more or less, uh, wants some form of love. Uh, love is obviously viewed as a great thing by many people. But of course, what people really want is a, a good kind of love, a love that's lasting, a love that um, adds to their life and enriches it, enriches themselves, enriches their viewpoint on the world, um, enriches, um, develops them in some way, shape, or form. Uh, no one really wants a love that will, you know, end in divorce or cause various uh, arguments and, and, and headaches endlessly, not to say that, you know, an argument uh, or, or conflict in a relationship is, is to be avoided uh, at all costs, but, but no one really seems to want a love that's, that's founded on endless bickering, endless problems, and ultimately divorce or sort of estrangement. So everyone in the world seeks the pure kind of love. Uh, people don't like sort of the impure and problematic versions of love or the problematic aspects. And so, um, of course, we have to distinguish now how, what, uh, how can we distinguish between the two forms of love and how can we uh, know whether we're in, in one or the other. Um, what are the characteristics of a pure form of love and what are the characteristics of sort of an impure, um, uh, corrupted or degraded form of love that's unlikely to last, unlikely to cause unlikely to be in our, uh, uh, good for us, unlikely to be um, uh, helpful to us as we live our life, uh, sort of a net loss, net, net negative rather than a net positive in our lives. How can we distinguish those two things? And I think the Phaedrus has some ideas on, on those two forms of love that are worth uh, considering. Now, given again that it's a platonic dialogue, unlike, for example, some of Aristotle's writings or Nietzsche's writings, the answer is not going to be uh, so clearly set forth for us. There are uh, various speakers in this dialogue, so Socrates and Phaedrus, and they are giving various speeches about love and some other subjects as well. But Plato never comes out again in the dialogue and says, this is what I think love is, or this is the best way to love. It's, that's not, it's never going to happen in a platonic dialogue. There are certain speakers and, and characters that give their views on love, but Plato's ideas are always, to some extent, unclear. But I think if you read the dialogues carefully enough and you start to see consistencies between the different arguments and uh, connections between the different arguments, both in this dialogue and in other dialogues, I think you start to get a very strong sense of where Plato's ideas were. And then, of course, this, beyond that, the question is always not what Plato thought or what Aristotle thought, um, but what we think, and wh whether we think these ideas are any good, uh, whether they are uh, a, a relic of a time that has come and gone, or whether there's something universally true about them, and uh, what is it that we find true in the ideas, can we make sense of them, can we understand them on our own basis. Uh, so the right answer or, or the, the, the argument should never be, you know, Plato, Plato said this about love or Nietzsche said this about love, or Aristotle said this about love, and therefore it's true, and I'm not going to question it anymore or think about it. The, the inquiry should always be, um, 
these are the ideas, these are the thinkers' ideas on love, um, do they make sense and why? Uh, so with that, um, we'll get into the Phaedrus. Now, the Phaedrus is a very, in terms of the structure of the dialogue, what's so interesting about it is there is there are two speeches on love um, sandwiched around two other sort of topics. And um, one speech is in favor of love, praising love, and another speech is sort of uh, criticizing or pointing out all the woes that are involved in love. And uh, and those two speeches are um, are uh, like I said sandwiched between two other topics, and I think there's um, it's not uh, incidental what topics those two uh, speeches are sort of um, uh, placed between. One is um, early on at two thirty two thirty a of the dialogue, um, Socrates um, says. Um, here, um, uh, he, he's, they're talking about uh, different um, uh, different stories and, and amusing tales in the city that are t told in the city and um, uh, legends. And he says, uh, uh, Socrates says that he has no time to sort of um, look into those tales because he says, the reason, my friend, is this. I'm still unable, as a Delphic inscription orders, to know myself. And it really seems to me ridiculous to look into other things before I have understood that. Um, this is this is why I do not concern myself with them. I have what is generally I accept what is generally believed, and as I was just saying, I look not into them but into my own self. Am I a beast more complicated and savage than typhoon, or am I a tamer, simpler animal with a share in a divine and gentle nature? Um, so the dialogue begins with a quite very arresting question. Uh, Socrates saying that he doesn't have time to look into a lot of other matters because fundamentally he's he's so caught up with figuring out who he is uh, and and understanding himself. He still doesn't know himself. He says, and it's kind of ridiculous for him to sort of go out into the world and try to understand other things when he doesn't even understand himself. Um, and um, and that's why he says he looks into himself and tries to discover who he is. And uh, one part of that question is figuring out whether he's a simple, tame creature, a gentle creature, or whether he's a sort of a complicated, savage beast. Um, and that, I, to me, I took that very significantly in a dialogue that it has two long speeches on love. That, that uh, initially you have Socrates saying, I... I knowledge of the self and the knowledge of uh, man's fundamental nature, whether it's gentle or more savage, is, is the most important thing to him. And that is something that he, he cannot spend much time on other things before he, before he knows himself. Um, and, and in a speech about love, which is of course between two creatures, um, to me that seemed like uh, sort of a, uh, some sort of uh, sort of uh, uh, wisdom there that, that to, to love another is to first know yourself. To correctly love another, you have to first know yourself because it's uh, love is something that's outside of you. And until you know who you are, what you're about, what sort of creature you are, whether you're a gentle, tame creature, or a beast, or whatever, that uh, you're bound to do other things poorly in the world because you don't even know yourself first. Um, so that, that was sort of significant to me. Um, and then, at, toward the end uh, of the dialogue, there are um, various um, uh, arguments given for why um, sort of most speeches on things in the city, sort of arguments in court and, and uh, political speeches in the city, all of these things are sort of common opinions in the city, um, uh, most sort of books, most writings that are published in the city, all of these things, Socrates says, uh, these things are aimed not at truth, in the city, but at persuasion and convict, convict, uh, uh, persuading people to believe the same things that the speaker believes. They're not aimed at truth, which truth is sort of outside of the interests of any one person. The truth, the truth is true because it's true. Uh, the truth is not true because um, you know someone has an interest in it being true. The truth is true just because it's true. Uh, and so, um, very interestingly, um, Socrates says that you know most of these things in the city, um, most of these kinds of discourses, th they're not aiming at truth. And um, the only real truth that matters for Socrates 
is that is that sort of sort of um, understanding that comes within the soul, and that kind of discourse he calls it that uh, that happens within an individual soul, where the individual soul understands uh, the various uh, key conceptions of human life, key values of human life, beauty, goodness, justice, all those things. The question here is at 276a. Um, so they're just talking about, right before that they talked about various writings in the city and, and, and they talk about how the problem with writings and most books is that once it's written down the meanings are sort of fixed and uh, and that it, you know they can't sort of talk back to you and so most writings are sort of limited in that sense there's only a sort of a limited truth you can't question a writing if the author is not there usually and then uh, so that's sort of the impure form of discourse or writing and then right after that Socrates says um, now tell me can we discern another kind of discourse a legitimate brother of this one can we say how it comes about and how it is by nature better and more capable Phaedrus responds, which one is that? How do you think it comes about? Socrates responds here, it is a discourse that is written down with knowledge in the soul of the listener. It can defend itself and it knows for whom it should speak and for whom it should remain silent. Uh, and then Phaedrus says, you mean the living, breathing discourse of the man who knows of which the written one can be fairly called an image. Socrates says, absolutely right. And so there is this discourse um, within man, within a sin individual man's soul, where man is understanding uh, things with knowledge. Uh, and again, for Plato, knowledge was not something that was gained by sort of sense perception, um, but it was gained in the soul from understanding, mental, mental understanding, intellectual understanding. And so uh, that's the only kind of knowledge in the city or the only kind of discourse in the city that Socrates seems to think is of any real true value. So we have, uh, again, a, uh, two speeches on love premised around one, an injunction for someone to know themselves, and then two, an injunction for someone, for, for Socrates, that he says, uh, well, the only thing that really, the only sort of discourse in the city that matters, the only sort of knowledge that really ultimately matters is knowledge that's in your soul that you gain through uh, a mental understanding. And so uh, that again to me is an understanding that, you know, to love properly, love requires before love um, some sort of uh, working out of the soul, some sort of knowledge of the soul, knowledge of the self, knowledge of um, important things in the soul, not, uh, uh, cult, sort of some sort of mental understanding of important things, and that and that uh, these things sort of in some way sandwich love. You know, again, these are on the corner, on the boundary of love two speeches on love and so it's important to think about this and whether it means um, could mean that you know again love is love is something that has to be anchored by these things these have to these things pre these should pre-exist love for love to go well uh, both knowledge of the self and knowledge of of important concepts and virtues in the soul um, so now getting getting returning now to the two speeches again we said there was a speech condemning love and there was a speech praising love in the dialogue and um, and it, interestingly after the speech condemning love um, Socrates says uh, uh, how could we have just love is such a wonderful thing obviously we can't deny that love is bad we can't just say love is bad there has to be we have to give a speech in favor of love so so then they give a speech praising love and and both both forms of love, interestingly, are viewed as sort of a sort of madness, you know, sort of madness in the soul, um, sort of madness of, of uh, uh, someone's being. It's not, love can't be again understood through the same sort of faculties and the same sort of personality traits and the same sort of uh, dimensions of uh, dimensions of self as all these other things. And so love uh, is, is clearly, clearly described as a sort of madness, both the pure and the impure forms, interestingly. So um, let me uh, pull out that passage here, 265b. Uh, uh, Phaedrus, uh, Socrates asks, And there are two kinds of madness, one produced by human illness, the other by a divinely inspired release from normally expect, accepted behavior, certainly. So love, we can have a love that's mad, that's sort of a result of some sort of illness, some sort of, um, uh, sort of something that's wrong within the soul. Uh, and then there's another kind of love that's divinely inspired, that's a release from sort of day-to-day -day humdrum events uh, that sort of allows the soul to sort of lift up 
um, and uh, it's very different. So both are a sort of form of madness, but the one is a madness form, uh, formed on what's worse than man and what's, what's, uh, what's lesser in man, and then the other is a form of madness that's based on what's truly good for man and what's truly uh, best in man. So um, now getting to these um, different speeches, um, the speech uh, condemning love, of course, comes first, um, and, and various um, uh, attributes are given of, of a love that uh, uh, is not uh, is, is condemned here. Uh, the type of love that Socrates uh, criticizes is, is sort of one that we can probably all very easily recognize. It's a love. It's a love between lovers who are insecure. Um, they are uh, easily annoyed with each other, uh, very easily annoyed. They are very jealous of one another. Um, they, uh, each lover sort of prevents the other from developing, from becoming the best person, from growing, from, from uh, succeeding in whatever they want to succeed in. So sort of, again, that jealousy component comes in. Uh, it's a love, uh, Socrates says, that is generally starts with sort of a desire or a hunger for the body of the other person sort of a sexual or physical component and that not that that is bad necessarily Plato says at all um, in, in other por portions of the dialogue he, he doesn't at all criticize sort of the uh, sort of the earthly or physical dimensions of love um, but uh, here he sort of criticizes a love that's really initially started and gets its real motivation from a desire for the other person's body before before he says before any lover knows anything about the character or personality traits of the other person. We don't, I don't know anything about the character. They don't know anything about the personality. There's just, they don't, uh, they don't, they haven't judged or looked into that, but uh, they're pursuing, these sorts of lovers are pursuing uh, the desires of the body at this point. Um, and uh, that is another um, characteristic of that kind of love. There tends to be a lot of flattery in this kind of love. Not flattery, of course, any s little bit of flattery is good, but this is flattery that's sort of gone beyond, well beyond what's best for the person. Um, and then, uh, in addition to these qualities, this kind of love, again, because it's so fundamentally based on desires of the body, ori originally, uh, once the person or once both people sort of wake up from that phase of desire, the bodily desire, then uh, sort of the... the uh, the more rational side of both lovers, uh, uh, sort of, uh, the soul comes out. They start to realistically assess the situation, who the other person is, and at that point, uh, uh, a whole host of bad things happen. The, this is at 241a. While he is still in love, uh, he is uh, he is harmful and disgusting. But after his love fades, he breaks his trust with you for the future, in spite of all the promises he has made with all those oaths and entreaties which just barely kept you in a relationship that was troublesome at the time in hope of future benefits. So then, by the time he should pay up, he has made a change and installed a new ruling government in himself, right-minded reason in place of the madness of love. The boy does not even realize that his lover is a different man. He insists on his reward for past favors and reminds him of what they had done and said before, as if he were still talking to the same man. The lover, however, is so ashamed that he does not dare tell the boy how much he has changed, or that there is no way now that he is in his right mind and under control again, that he can stand by the promises he had sworn to uphold when he was under that old mindless regime. He is afraid that if he has acted as if he had before, he would turn out to the same and revert to his old self. So now he is a refugee, fleeing from those old promises on which he must default by necessity. He, the former lover, has to switch roles and flee, since the coin has fallen the other way, while the boy must chase after him, angry and cursing. This, goes, this passage goes on and on, and then concludes with, These are the points you should bear in mind, my boy. You should know that the friendship of a lover arises without any goodwill at all. No, like food, its purpose is to sate hunger. Do wolves love lambs? That's how lovers befriend a boy. So again, when when the physical dimension ends, uh, these kinds of lovers um, find each other. Then uh, uh, one of one or the other person uh, has a desire to sort of back out. The other person is uh, uh, surprised and amazed that all the promises that were made were utterly worthless. Uh, the promises are not going to be kept. 
um, and uh, now the, the the person that had all the was receiving all the promises now chases after the other person uh, who will not uh, stand up to his promises and so there's sort of a role reversal now where the person that was initially pursuing he's the one being pursued or she's the one being pursued and uh, but but uh, it's sort of beyond repair because the person fundamentally only loved the body and as uh, uh, Socrates says here uh, you know the purpose of that love was to sate a sort of hunger there was a hunger for the body when that hunger is gone the person is gone um, or the lover is gone so this is um, this is obviously an account that we can recognize in some ways uh, of, of love uh, sort of uh, and not the ideal form we could certainly say we don't have to sort of mince any other words about it we could say this is certainly not the ideal form whatever adjective we want to use to describe this form of love is sort of up to each person but um, this is not the ideal form of love and and then of course then uh, Phaedrus says you know we, we can't how can we how can we be uh, giving these sorts of terrible speeches against love. We all know that love is a great thing. The gods would be unhappy with us if we uh, criticize love so so aggressively like we have. Um, we can't we can't just you know leave it at this. Um, and um, and so we they uh, they have to give a they give a uh, speech in praise of love. Um, and then and then so we we start to talk about um, in the dialogue you know what type of type of love is actually pure and um, and uh, um, uh, here's the passage um, if love is a god or something divine which he is so here it's clear uh, Socrates is saying love uh, can be a, a, a wonderful divine thing uh, but of course they've just given a, a speech that has been uh, um, very critical of love uh, he can't be bad in any way and yet our speeches just now spoke of him as if he were bad that is their offense against love. And so now they start to praise love and talk about a form of love that is actually uh, uh, a gift of the God. Um, and, and this kind of love is um, based upon um, a, uh, two people whose souls are aligned the right way. At uh, 246a, uh, um, Socrates talks about each human soul has sort of is sort of like a, should think about it like a, a charioteer that has different horses. He has a horse that's sort of the noble, the the good side of the person's character. Then, and then there's another horse that's sort of the bad, unruly, passionate side. Um, and uh, and uh, sort of the, the key task of an individual person is to be able to in this, uh, have their soul in such a way where they allow the better uh, horse to be in charge. Uh, the better horse uh, 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 at uh, here we have a 246a uh, has sort of wings on it. These wings allow the soul to be lifted. The, the soul of the person is lifted. They they become uh, uh, sort of filled with positive feeling, filled with positive uh, character, good dimensions of personality, and they become sort of in a metaphorical sense lifted upward. Uh, here at 246a. By their nature, these wings have the power to lift up heavy things and raise them aloft, where the gods all dwell. And so, more than anything that pertains to the body, they are akin to the divine, uh, which has beauty, wisdom, goodness, and everything of that sort. These nourish the soul's wings, which grow best in their presence. So, uh, if a person has that side of their character in charge, they will be led upward, they will be led toward beauty, wisdom, goodness, and everything of that sort. Uh, and that is that the soul of that person will be led toward that. And if they're lucky enough to meet someone else that has a similar soul, whose soul is similarly inclined, who's reaching upward and uh, sort of the wings of the soul are, are going higher and being read, led toward uh, you know eternally good things, beauty, w wisdom, and goodness, which are again the very... Um, uh, platonic uh, sort of forms that we have talked about frequently, these being the things that for Plato uh, were most important for us to understand and, and know um, and strive after beauty, w wisdom, and goodness. Um, and, uh, and so uh, if, if two people meet like this, then this is a divine sort of love. This is a very pure love, uh, one that... Uh, one that uh, is then praised in the dialogue. 
and uh, it's probably it's praised in many uh, several passages, but but probably most principally um, here at uh, two fifty six. And interestingly, again, this is not a love. Uh, typically, the Platonic view of love is viewed as uh, not in any way physical. Uh, it's sort of a non-physical, spiritual, sort of a kindred, almost like a close friendship. But again, this is not in the Phaedrus. This is not the, the view of love that comes out uh, uh, of, of even the pure form of love. It certainly has physical dimensions. Uh, here at 256a, when they are in when they are in bed. The lover's undisciplined horse has a word to say to the charioteer that after all its sufferings it is entitled to a little fun. Meanwhile, the boy's bad horse has nothing to say, but swelling with desire, confused, it hugs the lover and kisses him in delight at his great good will. And whenever they are lying together, it is completely unable for its own part to deny the lover any favor he might beg to have. Its yokemate, however, along with its charioteer, resists such requests with modesty and reason. Now, if the victory goes to the better elements in both their minds, which lead them to follow the assigned regimen of philosophy, their life here below is one of bliss and shared understanding. They are modest and fully in control of themselves now that they have enslaved the part that brought trouble into the soul and set free the part that gave it virtue. Uh, again, the part, you know, the, the, the sort of unruly part has been, has been uh, you know, heart, uh, has been controlled, and the part that sort of strives toward virtue has been set set loose. Uh, after death, when they have grown wings and become weightless, they have won the first of three rounds in these, the true Olympic contests. There is no greater good than this, that either human self-control or divine madness can offer a man. There is no greater good than this, that either human self-control or divine madness can offer a man. Um... Uh, so in this account, love is viewed certainly has a physical dimension, but but led by philosophy, led by sort of a sort of self-control and understanding of of, um, of what is good in life, the virtues. This kind of love is presented by Plato as being actually the he says the greatest good, the greatest good that um, that the divine or that 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 divine madness or human self-control can offer a man. There's nothing better to be than to be in this sort of platonic, uh, in the infused love based on, again, virtue, based on goodness, based on what Plato calls an assigned regimen of philosophy, where both, both lovers are sort of cultivating their mental uh, understanding, making sure the soul of each person is, has appropriately channeled uh, the bad part and the good part. Uh, you know, of course, these are crude terms, but of course we all have have understandings of what these mean, what, what, are, what are the better parts of who we are, what are the lesser parts and the worst parts of who we are. Not all dimensions of personality are equal, not all dimensions of character should be uh, praised and viewed as equivalent. We definitely have better and worse dimensions of personality. So in, in, this, in this way, I think, in the Phaedrus, we get um, two obviously very pure two um, diametrically opposed conceptions of love that could not be different from one another. Uh, we have the impure form where uh, jealous, insecure lovers driven first primarily above all by a love of the body, no sort of care about the other person's character, in fact uh, doing things to prevent the other person from becoming as good as possible because of jealousy and other such reasons. Uh, a love that does not stay, a love that then, um, uh, after you know the, its desires are satisfied, uh, the promises made in that stage are completely ignored, uh, completely uh, f uh, uh, forgotten about. And then we have a love again, while still physical. Again, the Platonic conception here is not saying that this is not a physical form of love at all. It's like, I want keep stressing that because it's such a common misperception. Um, but it, a love that's fundamentally based on um, uh, 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 sort of understanding of, of, of the virtues, understanding and seeking to channel the best within each person, seeking to grow virtuous together. Uh, that is portrayed as one of the best, again, best forms of uh, greatest goods for man uh, that, that, uh, that, that, uh, that man has. And so we get two very diametrically opposed conceptions of love. And of course, anyone, as we all know, these are both ideal accounts. These are both ideal 
caricatures. Uh, there is no love in the world that doesn't have some of the impure, that doesn't have some of the pure. You know, maybe it started out pure, and maybe it changed over time, or maybe, or or or, or on even on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you could say any relationship, a loving relationship, has dimensions of both of these uh, conceptions. A uh, time when someone is is very jealous and insecure, and a time when people are trying to better each other and improve each other. So uh, to to say, you know, that that uh, uh, to sort of view this as. Uh, uh, to stop at the Platonic dialogue is sort of uh, to miss the point. And I think that's, again, P Plato's dialogues are usually the beginning of further thought. It should not be the, sort of the end uh, of, of, the, of the inquiry. Clearly, the pure form of love is, is preferable. But, of course, you know, human beings being what they are uh, and, and the various uh, things that affect people over the course of a life that, that sometimes spill over into a relationship, it's, it's almost impossible to have the pure form of love. It's just not attainable, um, no matter how hard we strive for it. We can probably approach it, but it's, it's likely to be almost impossible. But so the, the question is, or what's, what's useful to gain out of all this, to me, is, is first some of the, comp the, the very interesting uh, sandwiching of these two speeches of love between the, the importance of knowing the self, the importance of, of understanding the virtues uh, before you get involved in love. Uh, that, to me, is very important. And because once you know yourself, once you know the virtues, you would seem to have be in a better position to first be honest with someone else and know, know what it is that you're looking for, uh, and be able to um, uh, uh, tell someone else who you are, really. Um, but more important than that, even, um, I think the thing is to, to sort of uh, recognize uh, both of these sort of diametrically opposed views of love. And, and whenever you are in that kind of environment, or when you're debating whether to pursue love with someone, or, or you're debating whether to continue, is to see uh, uh, which one, which of the two characterized conceptions does uh, does my relationship or does my love most approximate? Which one is this most resemble? Of course there's going to be times when you feel like it's one or the other. You're going to have some good days. You're going to have some bad days in the relationship. Uh, there'll be times when you're on there, you're feeling great about it. But after a while, after time, after you start to see a repetitive pattern, what is what is the relationship more trending toward? What are the dominant characteristics? Is it resemble the impure one more? Does it resemble the pure one more? Is there a hope that it can resemble the pure one more? Can, can, you, can you see it going in, in one direction or the other? Uh, that is sort of at the most uh, probably useful uh, thing to sort of evaluate love and to see whether we can find love that's promotive of human good. Because again, uh, the love, as, as, as made clear in the dialogue, all forms of love are sort of a form of madness. We do things in love that we wouldn't do any time else. But if it's a madness that's that's born of sort of a sort of a sickness and a, and, a, and it's it's causing harm to us, then there's no need to pursue it. But of course, if it's a madness that's that's uh, elevating our soul and and um, allowing us to see beauty, with wisdom, and goodness, uh, it would be the better sort. And so that's sort of what I um, what I think. The, the message of the Phaedrus is, is sort of a message that there are these uh, two conceptions, there is these two views, but the knowledge of the self is probably precedes all of it, and that um, uh, to sort of give us an understanding of different forms of love and to help us segregate the one and the other, and of course the only thing we can add to it here is to say that, you know, again, the, the, the two conceptions are unlikely to be ever found in their pure form, but good judgment requires you to figure out um, each of us to figure out which one uh, any of our loves most resemble. And with that, we'll end for today. Bye-bye.